Nancy, you're out of your mind if you think I'm babysitting again. Okay, first of all, they're not babies anymore. And Max is in <sighs> real danger. She needs people around her. I know, but why does it always have to be me? Oh it's my like... god. He's got a point. And it's a pretty iconic one because back at the beginning of Stranger Things, Steve Harrington seemed like the last person you'd ever want to put in charge of some nerdy kids. He was a cocky high school bully, an a-hole jock, rich kid right out of a 1980s teen movie, and he didn't seem to care about much beyond getting inside Nancy Wheeler's pants. But that's just what the writers wanted us to think, because they had a trick up their sleeve that was going to set Steve Harrington on the road from bully to babysitter. I promise I keep his head safe, and that's exactly what I plan on doing. But before we get into this theory of evolution, why not take a moment to subscribe to the Nerdstalgic channel? The first season of Stranger Things dropped on Netflix in July of 2016. Although certainly evocative of modern serialized mystery shows like Lost or The 4400, the series was primarily a tribute to iconic media of the 1980s and late 1970s. Obvious influences include the films of directors like Steven Spielberg, John Hughes, Rob Reiner, and John Carpenter, as well as books by Stephen King. And as a remix of elements from the 70s and 80s most beloved classic, Classics, pretty much everyone and everything in Stranger Things was drawn from a trope that belonged to that era. Wide-eyed Mike Wheeler, for example, shares a lane with Elliot from E.T., Eleven has echoes of super-powered creepy kids from Firestarter's Charlie McGee, and Joyce Byers is more than reminiscent of Close Encounters of the Third Kind's Jillian Geiler. Played by actor Joe Keery, Steve Harrington was built from the DNA of characters like Better Off Dead's Roy Stalin, Pretty in Pink's Steph McKee, and any number of 80s movie jerks played by William Zabka. Don't touch it, punk. And while Steve was more nuanced and likable than most of those characters, it was pretty clear to anyone familiar with those tropes that he probably wasn't the guy we were supposed to be rooting for. We first hear about Steve from Nancy Wheeler. The formerly nerdy and plain, suddenly pretty and popular girl is relishing the attention she's getting from her high school's most handsome star athlete. You're gonna be so cool now, it's ridiculous. No, I'm not. But it's clearly driving a wedge between her and her still nerdy best friend, Barb. We like Barb. And and we've all seen enough movies to know that when good-hearted kids forsake their friends for the popular crew, it rarely works out well. So we're immediately a little concerned for both of them. Then we actually meet Steve. He's a suave, confident pretty boy who is clearly way more experienced than Nancy. He easily charms her into letting him study in secret with her in her bedroom, something she was reluctant to do at first. Later, he pressures her into drinking, which in turn causes her to pressure Barb into drinking. As anyone who's ever seen Scream knows, in 1980s horror movies, this kind of thing usually equates with sin and results in death. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. And here, it's Barb who will pay the price at the hands of the Demogorgon. Now, obviously Steve didn't know that was going to happen, but he's clearly a bad influence who applies peer pressure to get what he wants, so we don't really trust him or his intentions toward Nancy. Steve is also positioned as the romantic competition for quiet oddball Jonathan Byers in a love triangle centered around Nancy. Along the way Steve bullies Jonathan, and the two eventually have a showdown where he rips into Jonathan, insulting his mother, his family, and insinuating that they were somehow at fault for his brother Will's disappearance. It all leads up to Jonathan punching the bully in a moment that harkens back to similar punches from 80s films, like George McFly slugging Biff Tannen in Back to the Future. The two fight, and Steve loses. Full of regret and defeat, he goes to talk to Jonathan and accidentally stumbles into Jonathan and Nancy's planned confrontation with the Demogorgon. After he gets a look at the monster, a stalwart Nancy orders a confused and terrified Steve to go, and he obeys, leaving them behind in a moment that can only really be described as cowardly. It seemed like the ending that was always coming to Steve Harrington, the big tough bully scurrying away in fear, but at the last moment, he looks back at the house. Inside, the Demogorgon has Jonathan pinned to the floor and Nancy isn't in a position to do much about it. And it is here, at this exact moment, that the writers reveal Steve Harrington's high school bully persona was something of a misdirection, because the charming but cocky jerk he's really inspired by turns out to be the one with a heart of gold. Han Solo. Yes, like Solo, even when he's free and clear of danger, Steve comes back to save the day. And it's an incredibly effective moment because the show did such a great job of convincing us that he was just a cocky a-hole bully trope. Yet a rewatch shows that Steve was never really as bad as we tend to remember him being. The show just cleverly took advantage of the expectations of him we formed based on the tropes he most obviously resembled. And he resembled them so closely because the character was, in fact, originally an antagonist. According to Kiri, it was only 
only due to his intervention with the show's creators that Steve, who was originally so bad he forced himself on Nancy, was reconceived and rewritten as an aloof and jerky but ultimately well-intentioned hero. That's why, all along, the writers were careful to make sure Steve never crossed any lines that would make him irredeemable. For example, his confrontation with Jonathan when he broke his camera was in response to Jonathan taking a lewd picture of Nancy without her knowledge. Steve arguably goes too far and he shows off the practiced moves of an experienced bully. But he's also not wrong. And his angry attack on Jonathan in the alley is clearly motivated by his mistaken belief that Nancy had cheated on him. His jealousy makes him look and act like a jerk, but it's also very human and understandable. A far cry from just a bully picking on a weaker kid for sport. Also, unlike most of the characters he's based on, Steve is genuinely charming. This is greatly a function of Kiri's natural charisma, but we have no trouble understanding why someone like Nancy could be so into him. Steve is also repeatedly shown in the company of his more aggressive and sneering buddy, Tommy Hagen, often pointing out that Tommy is being too harsh with someone. Barbara, she's not here today. I seriously have no idea who you're talking about. Come on, don't be an ass, man. Did you, did you see her leave last night or not? It implied that, unlike Tommy, Steve had his limits. But it was never clear if he was being sincere in those moments or posturing for Nancy. Steve's return to the house to fight the Demogorgon, however, tied all of those beats together and proved that he had a conscience all along. It was incredibly well-earned, and it instantly made him a fan-favorite character. The masterful way this transformation is handled makes a striking contrast to the similar transformation undergone by the show's other bully, Billy Hargrove, who also eventually has a heroic turn. Unlike Steve, Billy is genuinely scary from the first moment we meet him. He yells at his sister Max to intimidate her, terrorizes her by speeding at her friends in his car, and becomes enraged that she's interested in Lucas, even making some comments that imply his racism. I'm older than you, and something you learn is that there are certain type of people in this world that you stay away from. Season 3 gives Billy a traumatic past, but no redemption arc, so all of the genuinely disturbing things he did are left unresolved when he makes his heel face turn and fights the Mind Flayer to help save Eleven. The moment isn't completely ineffective, but it feels unearned, especially when compared to the care and planning that clearly went into Steve's Season 1 arc. And that arc started paying dramatic dividends immediately in Season 2. Overshadowed in school by Billy and on the outs with Nancy, Steve finds himself increasingly hanging out with and bonding with Mike Lucas. Lucas Max, and especially Dustin. Drawn into their adventures, he protects the kids from Demogorgons and comes to act as something of an authority figure, leader, and guardian to the party. Or in other words, a babysitter. Fans called him Mom Steve, and Kiri very much took that role to heart. Hey, hey, hey! This is not happening. But the pairing of the defanged bully with the kids worked so well, it became Steve's main shtick moving forward. And by season three, he's about as far from the arrogant, stylish, rich boy of season one as he can get. Cut off by his family, he's forced to work at a mall ice cream shop where he has to dress in a goofy sailor suit and take orders from the quirky band nerd, Robin. And when the action gets going, he finds himself watching over Dustin and Erica, once again, cast as the babysitter. In season four, Steve watches over Dustin, Lucas, and Max, once again, acting as the protector but the season also reveals that all the babysitting stuff wasn't just for fun, it was always going somewhere. Steve's connection to the kids becomes the thing that shows Nancy he's become a better man. Later in the Upside Down, he explains to Nancy that he's capable of change and the thumb she gave him when she broke up with him made him a better man and that he still loves her. It's an incredibly moving moment that pays off four seasons of carefully plotted emotional storytelling. But more fundamentally, Steve Harrington's arc showed the dramatic power that can come from subverting tired old tropes like the 1980s school bully. Patiently playing into and then finally pulling the rug out from the audience's expectations made Steve's story one of the more memorable and moving threads of the entire series. He learned from his mistakes and became a better man in a believable way. Exactly the kind of guy you'd be happy to have looking over your kids when Demogorgons are about. So what do you think? Are you a Steve Harrington fan? And did you find his arc from bully to hero convincing? Let us know down in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, you'll definitely find others you like if you check out the rest of the channel. As always, thank you for subscribing to Nerdstalgic.